Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to come and talk to us today or come and listen to us today. For those who have travelled great distances, I thank you. And for our members of parliament who are here, I also thank them for their time. And for their staffers being here, I thank them for their coming as well. I'd also like to acknowledge Dale Webster, whose new service, the, Re the Regional, has documented the true extent of bank closures across Australia. Dale's reporting on this issue has won her the 2022 Andrew, sorry, June Andrews Award for Freelance Journalism and the Press, Melbourne Press Club's 2021 Quill Award for Rural and Regional Journalism. And we really do thank her for coming today and we thank her for the outstanding work she's done. The LPO Group, the Licensed Post Office Group, was founded in 2012 by Angela Cramp and myself. We saw a need to do something about the plight of licensed post offices and the Australia Post Network as a whole, whether it was licensed networks or their company-owned outlets. We were, as licensees, facing very difficult financial problems. Many of us were trading insolvent. We needed to do something. We got together with Ron Boswell, who directed us, helped us, pointed us in the right direction. With the assistance of Ron Boswell and Nick Xenophon, we organised the Senate inquiry. The results of that was quite good for us. We got some increases in payments. We got a focus away from the management of Australia Post onto the plight of the Post. But what we found over the last 10 years with the loss of our recent CEO is that we're now heading back into that same direction. And we are not prepared to sit back and watch that happen. Post offices are a vital part of the community and it doesn't matter whether you're in a very outback country town or whether you're in downtown Beresfield like I come from, which is in Newcastle, or whether you're in Shell Harbour like Angela. We service the community that the banks don't want to know about. We service the community that big business doesn't want to know about. They're our bread and butter. They're our people. So when we were contacted about, and we have been pushing for an Australia Post bank for 10 years, when we managed to get some momentum, we were very much behind it because we see it as a vital way for us to continue to service our communities, to be there for the people who need us, which is the vulnerable, the aged, those less educated, those people in our community who need the personal help and assistance the post offices give without question. We're there to help. We think that an Australia bank, bank via Australia Post, is the perfect fit. It helps Australia Post be profitable. It will help them. It will certainly help us to stay valid and in our communities. So we're very pleased to be here today to talk to you about this. We, one of the great things that is missing in the current banking situation is face-to-face -face banking. There is no face-to-face -face banking. If you've got a problem, you've got nowhere to go because the bank is not interested. You know, it doesn't bank matter if you've got $3.50 in the account or $350 in the account or $350,000 in the account. The big banks are not interested in us. And that's many of us and many of us in this room. We need a bank we are that bank. We are the option. <coughs> we think there are ways to do it, and uh, we will talk about that a little later. We're very lucky to have Matt Robson with us today. And Matt Robson's from New Zealand, and I know we don't usually um, pay a lot of respect to New Zealanders, but in this case, this man is well worth talking to. Australia, at the, your local post office currently services three of the big four banks. The ANZ did not want to know about us. The three banks that are there, what we are finding is they're charging their customers. They're closing their branches and saving about $3 million a year per branch they close. But then they're, trans they're saying, look, your post office is the place to go. But when you go there, by the way, we're now going to charge you upwards of $4 for that transaction. 
So they're saving a lot of money by closing their branch, and then they're increasing their profits by charging you to come and get face to face. We don't think that's right. We think an Australia Post Bank could solve part of that problem. The Australia Post Bank, in our view, would look after mums and dad bankers, small business, because again, as small business people, we understand that the big banks are not interested in us. They don't care about little business. And when I say little business, I'm talking about businesses, who, whether you're turning over $50,000 a year or $5 million a year, the big banks are not interested. We'd like a community-based bank owned by the government that will look after us. As I say, Australia Post has had lots of conversations about a post bank. One of our CEOs, Ahmed Fahour, was a big fan, but just we couldn't get it over the line. Part of what we need, which is one of the reasons I'm very pleased to see so many people here, is we need to start a grassroots movement. We need people to get behind this, the common man. If we all get behind this, we can get this across the line. This is a win-win for the communities. This is a win-win for government, the government of the day. It's a very big win-win. As I say, if we combine banking with postal services, it's a win for the community. So I'd like to introduce Matt Robson, who's going to give us a, a bit of a conversation around um, how it went in New Zealand. But one last thing before I do, I highly recommend you all have a read of this. They're all, They're all over here yeah. for you guys to get, pick one up. It was done by Capa uh, Per Capita, it's a, which is a union-based think tank. They did a report into the community banking. It is well worth the read. I highly recommend that on your way out you pick one up, have a read. It's supported by the unions. It's supported by the CEPU. This is a really good place for us to start. So I would encourage you all to grab one of these on the way out. I'd like you to put your hand together for Matt Robson. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Andrew. Uh, from New Zealand, we always say to our audiences, uh, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto kato, which uh, doesn't mean that I've forgotten what I said before. I say it three times, but three times, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, that's always said at the beginnings of every meeting. I particularly want to thank uh, Andrew uh, as the chair and as the chair of the uh, licensed post office group. And I've met uh, Angela. I'm not quite sure of the division of labour, but I actually think Angela's pretty much the boss, but that's good um, in these days. And I've been taken around by them and I'm very impressed with what they do. It's so good. I was going to point to Bob Catter, but I think he must have just gone. Uh, but to have a senator, so a senator on this side, a member of parliament on that side. No, right, and we had it. So to come to an important meeting like this and people in the audience and with the wonders of technology that it will spread throughout the land uh, and the most important issue you're discussing, because what you're actually discussing is the development of Australia or the continued development and the needs of your own people. Um, I wanted to open by saying to my fellow Australians, because I was born in Brisbane and grew up with the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, the pride of my mother and father that this had been developed. They used to talk about Ben Chifley, uh, Ted Theodore <coughs> in Queensland, and so it was part of my DNA. And when I was young, and I uh, grew up then uh, from my teenage years in New Zealand and later on became a cabinet minister. I drew on that tradition as well across both countries and I was given the honour in my cabinet or the cabinet of Helen Clark to be the minister of prisons I was told because being an Australian it was probably a very fitting thing to make me the minister of prisons. I wasn't quite sure whether they were insulting me and I would explain that I had been sent across the Tasman like uh, Superman from Krypton, to raise the level of New Zealanders' political awareness. I found that New Zealanders did have a sense of humour and encouraged me. But when I was invited to speak, I wondered at the wisdom of a New Zealander coming to tell Australians uh, perhaps uh, what's a good idea politically. But we share a common a tradition. Little known is that the first 
uh, reform, really reforming government, New Zealand, 1935, which was a Labor government during the Depression, and introduced the welfare state and uh, many of the uh, developments of publicly owned industries, uh, progressive taxation. The Prime Minister was Australian, Mickey Savage. Half the Cabinet were Australians, and the former leader, uh, a man called Harry Holland, had come from Victoria as well. So I know we've given back here, Mr Barnaby Joyce, uh, Mr. Belke Peterson in Queensland. So it seems to be a, a free trade agreement well before the free trade agreement. On the question of the bank, it's dear to our heart uh, in New Zealand and it's dear to the heart of the people. And that's where we share a common tradition. Your formation going back to 1911 with the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, King O'Malley through to such giants as uh, Ted Theodore and others and later on Ben Chifley but I believe across a number of political parties uh, a common uh, support. And it's heartening in the time that I've spent here in Canberra to see that you're actually a step ahead of us in New Zealand, and I'll come to that. And that's the number of people in different parties thinking about this issue, not as a narrow political issue, but as one, what is the benefit for the people of Australia? And our forebears in this, in all parties, recognised that unrestrained financial power was a danger to countries because you become a hostage to that unregulated financial power. And banking is at the heart of that financial power of what countries need to exist. And what we had in uh, New Zealand, uh, which actually assisted us to get back a public bank, we don't call it the Kiwi Bank, uh, was the fact that uh, the banks were sold to private interests, and what's was worse, they were Australian banks. And I'm sorry to say that I even joined in the little bit of nudging to get people to say, how dare we be owned by Australian banks? Um, I felt a little bit ashamed in my heart at doing this bit of jingoism. But it reflected the fact that New Zealanders recognised that they as a people were not in control of their future. Well, they didn't control or have a very strong uh, financial interest in the greatest power in the country, how you raise your capital, how you spend it, and where the profits go, then you're actually throwing away your sovereignty. And that's what we had done. I won't go into the long history of it, but in the 80s, uh, the, it was a Labour government, uh, ironically enough, that took the people's assets, built up over generations of toil of the New Zealand people, and put into public hands for public benefit and sold them for a song. So it wasn't just the, our version of the Commonwealth Bank, which was the Bank of New Zealand, which was sold for a song to a privately owned Australian bank, uh, but everything else, the airline, the rail, uh, the insurance industries, the post offices, everything went uh, in a very short period. And it's taken now, from that period, the 80s, 40 years to get back to a stage where the recognition that wealth is created collectively and should be used for collective good. And to do that you need a government which has the strength and the vision to do that. And I think one way that you're ahead of us, as I said, in going around this parliament is that there are p p members of different parties who are on track to at least discuss the idea of how we control public finance and give our governments, perhaps whichever complexion, the financial ability to have an arm for development. And I'll come back to that. Why are you ahead of us in Australia? Well, our party, called the Alliance, we came, in, came into coalition uh, with the Labor Party in 1999. And just to give you some orientation, because I don't know how much people here are able to follow New Zealand politics, but in Australian terms, uh, we had been part of the Labour Party family, uh, then we had a divorce over the question of the sale of public assets. But we weren't the equivalent of the DLP, uh, we were the other side, we were, we, were the <laughs> we were to the left of the Labour Party on these issues. But we came together again after 10 years of separation in a coalition government in 1999. But we were the only party in the party, in the parliament, that would support the regain of a public bank. So that's why I say we're different from the stage that you've reached 
uh, in Australia from what I, can, what I can see. And why did the other parties not support it? Well, from the, the most conservative party, the, the National Party, they were committed to the mantra of private good, public bad, private good, public bad. They just, they just believed it. In the other parties, uh, the party called New Zealand First, uh, the Green Party, it was more of a, I would say, without wanting to insult people who were colleagues in Parliament, that it was a sort of a pettiness that because it was the, my party, the Alliance, which had the idea, that you opposed it because of that. And when you've got a big question, which is the development of the country, it doesn't actually belong to uh, one party, it belongs to the country. So how did, how did we do this? Well, the public was ahead of politicians on the question of having a public bank. The New Zealand public had suffered closures of branches, particularly felt in the rural areas. And in Australia, it's even a bigger need because of the distances. And I know those distances. I used to live in Darwin and travel down through Mount Isaac, Loncurry. If we go down the coast through Rockhampton. And you even have a bigger need to service through regional areas. But New Zealand has the same, and people found that their branches were closed. Not only the banks, but the post office as well. That's an important connection because we based the new bank on the post office structure. But they also found that the banks were, well, I was going to use the words impolite, lying to them, cheating them, and you've had a Royal Commission on this, ahead of us on that. Uh, with the fees, there was a cartel of the banks once the Bank of New Zealand was sold, which was the state bank, and they just put the fees up and they felt like a charge for different things, worked together on this, and there was no competition to them. So the public were fed up with this situation. But we were a small party, we had uh, 12 members of parliament, Labour had 50, um, and the Labour Party leadership in Cabinet our colleagues uh, weren't for the brave step of going back to a bank. We said to them in Cabinet, this is a demand of the people, it's not just our party. They still didn't listen. This is a demand we said of your party members as they got branches from the Labour Party coming and asking, please support. It was called Jim's Bank. The leader of our party is Jim Anderson, former president of the Labour Party, a man of great, great stature, and uh, the people called it Jim's Bank. Interestingly, when I was talking to uh, uh, Barnaby Joyce the other day, he said a bank initiative that he had in Queensland, I think, I think Queensland, or somewhere, um, was derided as Barnaby's Bank. I said to him, well, in New Zealand, they tried the same with Jim's Bank. But it became a popular term. Everybody was saying, we want Jim's Bank, we want Jim's Bank. Didn't even have a name when it was first started. It was called Jim's Bank. I'm going to buy, join up to Jim's Bank. So what was a term of derision became a, a, a strength. It was also called the People's Bank, which has a ring to it. So the public was for it. And although our party was small, we had the support of the people. Quite a powerful thing to have the support of the people. And when it came down to it, and to argue, we also had the support of another powerful institution, the post office bank, the post office itself. Not all of the board, now this is where the politics come in, and I leave that for you to work out you know, when you have boards and when you have politics, that's where you come in with your members of parliament and other skilled people uh, to work through these issues. But on the board of the post bank, a powerful ally appeared in the form of the chairman called uh, Ross Armstrong, and he'd been a former president of the National Party. Uh, so he came from a conservative political background, but he joined with Jim Anderton. And he had to work almost secretly in his bank because his board were reporting to the opponents of the idea of a people's bank. So what he did was he recognised with the key allies on his board and on his staff that the post office could build a business case for a bank. And they did that to show that the structure of the post offices throughout New Zealand were the bank, the staff were the bank, the technology were the bank, and they already had it there. And that all you needed was a little bit of money, seeding money, from the government. Not even massive amounts of money, but some. And he locked away 
in part of the building where the post office headquarters were, a secret two rooms, two floors, and put to work a banker, because they thought, well, we need a banker to tell us how to run a bank, and other experts who put the business case together. That was brought to us, and then we had this business case, because you then had to argue with the Treasury. Now, Treasury in New Zealand, I don't know about your Treasury, uh, was not an objective body. They were all supportive of privatisation, derided the role of the public, a powerful enemy. And they would go to the Minister of Finance, who was a Labour member, Michael Cullen, sadly departed last year. Uh, he, he died of cancer. Yeah, he, and they would say, Minister, this is just rubbish, you can't have a bank. <coughs> He'd bring that to us. And we would say, get them to sit down and go through the business case. And we sent Jim Anderton into that. It was a cabinet committee set up. And Jim Anderton went into the bank, uh, to the committee, armed with the business case and his own knowledge of history that we'd had a bank that worked, the Bank of New Zealand, which at one stage, before it was sold in 87, under the market value, uh, had 25% uh, of the business, banking business across the country, delivered taxes to the government, unlike private banks, didn't make a vocation of paying the least amount of tax, it paid as much tax as it could uh, to its shareholder, the people, and uh, we had all that knowledge. And the Treasury came, the, the three Labour ministers said, no, 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 we're saying yes, yes, yes. And uh, argument by argument, Jim Anderson knocked down by the facts. And in the end, all their arguments gone, they were like the emperor with no clothes. They only had the ideological argument. Well, you can't do it. Banks are owned by private enterprise. That's all. Famously, Annette King, who is the High Commissioner now here in Canberra, a colleague of mine, she was on the Cabinet Committee, exhausted by the negotiations, turned to the Treasurer, the Minister of Finance, Michael Cullen, and said, Michael, for God's sake, Jim's knocked down every bloody argument that you've had. Give him his bloody bank. And Michael Cullen frowned and said, oh, OK. And that's how we got the bank. $60 million was given. And Michael said to us in the Cabinet, to the Alliance, this is all you're getting. Don't come for any more. <laughs> Very gracious. Helen Clark, the Prime Minister, went on television saying she wasn't joining this new bank. She was sticking with the sole Bank of New Zealand. Three years later, there were 800,000 customers for the Post Office Bank, or we called it at that time the Kiwi Bank. Uh, I forget where the name came from, but people suddenly called it our Kiwi Bank. So we called it the Kiwi Bank, which is a very powerful symbol. And it was making such a profit that it paid back the $60 million plus more. And it's been an enormous success. A success because we showed you could put a bank up and it could compete. Now, there are problems which will be to the benefit of what you do here. There's been changes of government, there's been problems with the board, but the, but the bank itself is now owned as a concept by the people of New Zealand and neither the National Party, the Conservative Party, or even the Labour Party were game to sell it. So to the issue of the post, Post Bank. That's what's been an enormous success, and you have uh, Auspost here. I don't know all the ins and outs of how it operates, but structure across the country. It's sitting there waiting to be used as a bank. And. Good time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I thought you winded up. I'll wind it up, yeah. I'm listening to the, the two chairs. But so the Post Office Bank is the key to having a structure and being able to take on the larger banks. So I want to tell you that success story. We did it. I think Australia can work with New Zealand in an ANZAC spirit on this. Regain yourself a, a bank. Regain yourself your sovereignty and your ability to use it for the development of your country. Thank you. Thank you. And as an Aussie, I'm sure if you can do it, we can do it better. Oh, as <laughs> a challenge? Not that I said that out loud. Thank you for your words. Um, we have been working with this cast of politicians for many years to try and do something about Australia Post to ensure its survival for another 200 years. 
Bob Catterer is a champion. Malcolm Roberts has long been a champion of the LPOs. I don't know whether there's something about Queensland. Jared is there also is from Queensland. Like we are a national network. It's not just this lot, but I would welcome you, Bob, to come and tell us what you think, and then Malcolm and Jared after that. <coughs> Like my erudite colleague from across the sea, um, um, I was the uh, minister in Queensland charged with uh, primary responsibility for the state bank. And uh, the head of the state bank was a fairly typical, um, what's the word I'm after, member of the establishment. And uh, at an exclusive club, I think they uh, didn't quite see who was going in or I wouldn't have been allowed in. But <laughs> But anyway, at his exclusive club, he uh, said, oh, Bob, a uh, quarter of the sugar industry has to go, has to go. Um, and uh, and uh, I, I said, you know, um, the only thing's going to go is you if you keep talking like that. <laughs> oh, you don't understand the international market situation. There's overproduction from India and, and Brazil. Uh, you don't understand the international situation. Two weeks later, um, he was sacked, and uh, the Courier Mail on the front page, uh, Bob Catter sacks the head of the uh, State Bank so that the State Bank can look after his rich, cow cocky friends, you know. And I said, well, there's an element of truth in that. I don't think they're rich. That's, you know, the rest of it's pretty. Uh, um, the uh, Labor Party, the People's Party, as soon as they got elected in Australia, um, moved King O'Malley to start off People's Bank because um, the real um, decisions are made not by politicians but by the banks. Um, if you want to build a house, you don't go and ask your local politician for permission, but you, you ask your local bank for permission. Now that's very interesting because my hometown of Cloncurry, my family have lived for 150 odd years in that area, um, um, we can't build a house because the bank has now redlined our area. Now, this is very interesting because in Australia, they've redlined poor areas in the cities and rural areas. They're redlined so you can't get money to build a house in those areas or buy a house in those areas. And I'm exaggerating slightly, but only slightly. Um, now, that's interesting because in America, they have redlining. Redlining is the redlined areas are where the banks have to put in 5% of their deposits. So their redlining is to help those areas. Our redlining is to destroy those areas. But it doesn't really matter because we haven't got any banks left in any of those towns anyway. There's no banks there at all. Now, the, the person that um, I went to uh, in um, the bank I was with in Charters Towers, um, she was in her early 20s. Um, a kid that had no experience in the world or banking or anything else, and she made the decisions. Now, the post office bosses, the little post office agents in each of the western towns, in Huendon, it was Chamber of Commerce president, and would have easily got elected mayor if he'd chosen to run for it. In other words, the most person most respected in that town, right? The next town on was the leading grazing family, they're very big graziers, but one element of the family, took over the post office, they still had the cattle station, but uh, went in there. The next area was President of the Chamber of Commerce, and again would have been mayor of the town if they'd wanted to be. And uh, the fourth area, well, when you drive into the town, it's called Robertson Road, and over the Robertsons, uh, you know, the most prominent uh, and most um, influential people in town. So, so you have a bank run by a 20-year-old kid, or you have a bank run by the most highly respected people in the community. That, that's the difference between the Postal Services Bank and the banks that we've got. Well, we don't have banks in those areas anyway at the present moment. Um, but, you know, on the bigger picture, <clears throat> and uh, I spent half my life reading books on these things and, uh, and published a book of my own which uh, touches on these subjects, right? If you want to build an industry, um, you can go to the government, yes, but um, I think you have to go to a bank at some stage to borrow money. Without borrowing money, nothing can happen. If you go to 
the first Australian areas, a lot of people use the word Aboriginal, I don't, our first Australian areas, communities, um, they don't have any freehold title. It doesn't exist. I was briefly the minister and I introduced freehold title, but as soon as I was gone, the uh, socialist government that came in removed the freehold title, reasons best known to themselves. But they can't borrow money. Without a freehold title, they can't borrow money. So there are no commercial activities in any of those areas. And I don't want to go sideways on that, but because everyone drinks, and if you drink, it's a criminal charge in Queensland, you can't get a blue card after you get a criminal charge. So they can't get a job in the government, they can't have any commercial activity because they can't get a freehold title. The freehold title is banking. Um, I just want to say that we were brought up in a society which said communism was bad. You know, you can just have a look at America and some of the great books at the time pointed out comparing America's economic performance and that of Russia and China. Well, if you publish the book now, it is just the reverse. Now, what's the difference? Because we have petrol refineries in Australia, don't quote me on the figures, they do 6,000 uh, megalitres, right? China, when it builds a refinery, has 100,000 megalitres. <laughs> they can get the money to build at economies of scale. And people say, oh, they got cheap labour. Well, they don't have cheap labour now. I mean, <laughs> it's not a cheap labour country anymore. Um, what, why they succeed, as Japan did with the Zaibatsu and the government lending instrumentalities, they were able to build industries overnight. Um, there was a bloke called Lawrence Hartnett who said Australia could become a second industry, secondary industry country. Uh, we can build motor cars even in this country. No one believed him, of course. And, uh, but Ben Chifley did. And uh, um, <clears throat> they couldn't get any money, of course, to build a car industry in Australia. But uh, Chifley rang up the Commonwealth Bank and provided the three million pounds needed to establish the motor car industry. And it was so successful that until the free marketeers took control of Australia, it was so successful that 62% of every car in Australia was a Holden. It was 62%. That was how successful it was. Uh, and it led us into secondary industry. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I speak with authority because I had the State Bank in Queensland. The Australia was saved from the depression by the sugar industry, a um, matter of public record. And uh, of course it's carried the economy of Queensland for Queensland's entire history. Coal has joined it now, um, the sugar industry. Um, but we are um, one of the biggest, three biggest exporting nations in the world in sugar. Um, the, the head of the industry said 25% of the industry had to go. And uh, I showed him the graphs of sugar, cattle, grain. They go up, they go down. You do the same with mining. You know, they're cyclical, right? So we're on a down cycle. Um, what, you're, going to, you're going to close the industry down because we're on a down cycle. They look pretty stupid when we had an up cycle. So anyway, he was gone within two weeks. And uh, we, um, he said 25% of the industry had to go. Well, you know, you do need a cleaning out. And, you know, we accepted that 4 or 5% of the industry had to go. A um, uh, bit of a cleaning out of the lazy and stupid people out of the industry. Um, that needs to happen. Oh, we bought 20% through. So um, you've got a bank that takes a bigger picture, that doesn't take a narrow, stupid, short-term picture. It takes a bigger picture, long-term picture. Uh, and when that was done, we were able to preserve a quarter of that industry that carried the economy of our state. So whether you want to go forward, and I just said to, um, and I'll conclude on this note, I said to a um, um, senior person in the government, I won't say anything more than that without his permission, um, I said, well, that's a map of Australia, isn't it? And he said, yeah, of course it is. I said, no, it's not. It's a map of Australia, shorn of a little narrow coastal strip um, and a little dot around Perth. The rest of it's empty. There's only a million people living there. I mean, how much longer do you think that's going to go on for? Those who cannot learn from history will be doomed to repeat it. Now, 250 years ago, we Australians said, we don't need armed forces, 
We don't need population. We don't need to populate an empty country. No, we don't need any of those things. And if it wasn't for the Christian missionaries, we would have been annihilated. We Australians 250 years ago, we would have been annihilated. We would not exist today. Um, so, you know, let's not make the same mistakes again. But I said, give me the money and give me the dams and I will put a million people uh, in the Northern Territory. I don't know about the other parts of the Northern Territory, but I speak with authority of the border areas in the Northern Territory and the mid all of inland North Queensland. And I'll give you a million people where there are now 40,000 people. God bless you all. Thank you very much. And I congratulate the initiatives taken here. Um, <clears throat> My name is Senator Malcolm Roberts. I represent the people of Queensland. And I want to tell you just how excited I am to be here. This is wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Matt. It is a really wonderful initiative because I'm going to talk just very briefly about some, some notes I made while Matt was talking. To echo Bob's comments, Harry Truman said, the, and he's the most widely read United States president ever. Harry Truman said, the only thing new in the world is the history you haven't read. It's all happened before. It's happened in North Dakota, it's happened in New Zealand, it's happened in Japan, it's happened in other places. And I want to thank, first of all, Angela Cramp. I haven't met Andrew before. He comes from a decent place. I've been in Beresfield. I've lived near there. Um, I want to thank Robbie, Robbie Barwick. And I want to thank the Citizens of the Electoral Council. It's not the in thing to do to thank the CEC, but I want to thank them. I want to acknowledge them because they've done marvellous work over many, many years. And they, we would be far worse off in this country if the Citizens of the Electoral Council and the Citizens Party had not done their work. So please thank Craig Isherwood and the others in the <laughs> Citizens of the I think it's, it's really important to be proud of people that do the job for the country rather than hide because some people, because they're doing so well that they're painted as villains when they're not. So it's really important to stand up for them. Um, the first comment I want to make is you left out, you, your speech, I really appreciated it, Matt, but, and I appreciated our meeting the other day, but you left out what is arguably the most important benefit of all of a public bank, accountability. Without the public bank, there is no accountability on the big buses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. None at yeah, yeah. all. Yeah, yeah. No policemen. And that's why the Treasury in our country looks after the globalists. They're not interested in doing what we need. And the, and the Treasury would have been the ones helping to dismantle the original Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Because the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, just by being present, provided accountability of, against the major banks. The Commonwealth Bank of Australia was introduced by the Fisher government, the Labor government, in 1911, came into force in 1912. And after a very, very successful early decade, it was slowly white anted by both Labor Party and Liberal Party who were working for the big banks. That's what we're up against. And I don't say that lightly. I've read about the Commonwealth Bank and the history. Um, Robbie's given me an excellent paper by Craig Isherwood, which I would strongly recommend people read. It's only very short. It's packed with information. And there's wonderful figures there on, on the value adding of aluminium. This is what we need. We just got the Senate to approve an inquiry into the Project Iron Boomerang. That's what we need. And we need the whole country opened up, and it will only happen, as, as Bob Catter said, by getting a, a public bank. But the accountability is crucial. Uh, I, I echo your comment, uh, Matt, about the greatest power in a country is the ability to raise currency. That is without doubt. Um, another benefit of a public bank is customer service, especially with these people. We've already got it ready made. People, the banks are not interested in customer service. They're interested in control. They're interested in behalf of the globalists in control. They don't want to serve the people, they want to control the people. So that's another benefit. The Commonwealth Bank, as I said, was systematically destroyed despite being so bloody successful in global terms within our country. When I say global terms, I mean it was known around the world. Then we have a look at other places like the bank, the State Bank of North Dakota. Is that the proper name, Robbie? Mm -hmm. State Bank. Since its inception, it's a public bank, people's bank in the state of North Dakota. 
It is the only bank that has made a profit every year of its existence in America. The, the globalists, the multinational predators, they have gone to the government cap in hand because they want to be socialists when the, when the shit hits the fan. And when, when, in good times they want to be capitalists and take our money. In the bad times they want to say, give us your money. So Bank of North Dakota's screaming success. Ellen Hodgson Brown has written very, very uh, well on the need for public bank, extensively on the public bank. Um, and I just want to say again that the original Commonwealth Bank did us a huge, huge service, not only as individuals, as, as uh, public customers, but nationally. It got us off, off, it got us onto the map as a country. So I just want to finish, Angela, with thanks again for the people who've organised this. I strongly support it. Our staff have been working on this for a while, as you know. Um, it is proven that the major banks in this country are not at all interested in service. They're interested in control. The second thing that's proven is that public banks work. There is no doubt about that. It is entirely proven. And the third thing that's proven is that people of this country need service for all the reasons Bob mentioned. People need service, small business needs service, the Aboriginals need service, the whole country needs service. We need a better service from a banking system. The public bank is the way to get it. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, hi guys, it's great to be here today and uh, can I thank Angela and Robbie and the guys for putting this uh, event on today. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a very passionate back, uh, backer of a public bank uh, for two reasons. I'm passionate about services to regional Australia and to metropolitan Australia. I do believe it is the role of government to provide essential services. Uh, the other passion of mine is monetary policy and the way monetary policy is used. Um, and as Malcolm touched on, uh, you know, it, it's the most powerful uh, weapon or instrument, if, if that's how you want to call it, a country can have is the ability to issue its own currency. And that does play into how our banking system works within Australia. Um, but we should also add another word to the, uh, uh, banking, and that is our insurance sector as well. Uh, I grew up in a time, and it's interesting, Angela, you mentioned about the Queenslanders being in the room here. I think we're all old enough to remember Sir J.B. Ockie Peterson and the great work he did along with Leo Hilscher in building a state of Queensland. And I certainly wasn't around the late 50s, but I know Bob and Malcolm may have been around that stage. But they rebuilt, you know, effectively the National Party in the 60s and 70s, rebuilt Queensland from a broke country. But they did that uh, by opening up a lot of deposits, the Weebot Bauxite deposits, the Bowen Basin Coal deposits. Uh, they went and built ports and roads, big dams like the Burdekin, Wyvernhoe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and interestingly enough, Leo Hilscher actually had to borrow that money and he borrowed, when he opened up a lot of these deposits yeah, in, yeah, in the railway, yeah, yeah. he actually borrowed at 8% um, and repaid both the interest and principal within 10 years. So it just goes to so 180% return in 10 years. It just goes to show what you can do if you use your money appropriately and you're prepared to invest in infrastructure. Uh, but back to, but the other, you know, I've got off, off track there, but I just want to talk about the importance of having a, a government-owned insurance uh, operation as well. Uh, many of the state government insurance offices were sold uh, throughout the late 80s and early 90s and we've now got a really uh, dysfunctional insurance market here in Australia where it's just about impossible for small business uh, and many businesses to get insurance and I really think that we need, you know, with the postal bank an insurance <coughs> bank, well, you know, an insurance office uh, that, that works in tandem with the insurance bank and then we wrap that in as well with not just a retail bank but obviously business banking as well. Um, so, yeah, and, and I think the other thing too, it, it's really important to note is that I, I don't know that we would have had that Banking Royal Commission in 2016 or whenever it was had we had the CBA remained in, in public hands because the CBA, a, a public bank, would have kept a break on, on the nefarious activities of the private banks and, and, and the exploitation that they carried on with. Mind you, um, superannuation coming in didn't help help a lot either, but I, I'm a big believer in a public-private uh, um, operations in many fields, including education and health, because what you'll get is you'll get the private sector will always be driving efficiency, um, but then the public se sector will always keep a break on the private sector if they start getting um, too, you know, ex exploiting, uh, you know, people too much, they can always fall back and have the public sector as a safety net. And I think that should apply to banking and insurance as well. 
Um, and, and we know it works because the Commonwealth Bank, you know, was a successful enterprise for, what, 60 or 70 years before it was privatised. And ironically enough, now it makes more, I think, close to $10 billion a year. I think the total sale proceeds of the CBA over its three tranches was about $8 billion. Uh, and just imagine if we had $10 billion coming into uh, the government's coffers right now and how valuable uh, a contribution yeah. that would be in helping pay off, uh, you know, the government's debt. Um, so that's that's obviously the, the retail side of things, but I you know I just want to touch on briefly you know the the monetary policy side of things and our wholesale uh, funding of, of governments in this country. Uh, the first person to issue a currency in this country was of course Lachlan Macquarie, as many of you I'm sure would be aware of, and he issued the Holy Dollar, um, which was used to fund you know the building the Sydney Hospital, the, the barracks there in Macquarie Street today. But essentially, you know, it, it's very simple. If you want to build a dam for a billion dollars, if you fund that dam with foreign debt, the first billion dollars you make, you have to repay in foreign debt. And given that it might take, you know, infrastructure's long tail, it's patient capital, it might take 25 years to repay that debt at, let's say, 4%, so let's say another 100% interest. It's another, another billion dollars gone offshore, basically because we wouldn't use our own printing press to fund the... Um, construction of what I call sovereign-backed uh, um, infrastructure, which is critical if we're going to remain a sovereign nation. So we, we really need to have a look at, uh, at the way we go about our monetary policy in this country. Uh, I, I don't believe that we should be continuing to fund uh, our, our um, living, our standard of living with foreign debt. Uh, we've just, you know, we're hitting, we're close to hitting a trillion dollars in debt with the government, the federal government. Uh, and I think many of the state governments have record levels funding of debt as well. And, and that, that is going to be really toxic if interest rates increase as well. Well, they are increasing, it's not an if. Um, and I mean, the RBA to me has just completely lost the plot. I mean, I don't think they should have ever lowered interest rates as low as they did, but they certainly shouldn't be jacking up interest rates as fast as they are now, um, given the asset bubble they created in the first place. It's like literally going to a party um, with three bottles of Bundy and you know three six packs uh, in your own car, knowing you're going to drive home, it's only going to end up in tears, right? And, and it's reckless. It mightn't end up in tears, but it's certainly at the very least reckless. So um, anyway, look, so it's great to be here today, and I'm, I'm more than happy to put my support and, and lobby many of the neoliberals within my party, uh, you know, and of course, you know, they, they always seem, they can't, you know, what, what, what I find very frustrating is, is that what they don't get is with these monopolies once they're privatised, is that they just get taken over by rent-seeking parasites. And that's what they are. You know, our energy market has basically been destroyed by rent-seeking parasites. We saw in the GFC, Wayne Swan banned short-selling of the, of the private banks. I mean, I could just, you know, I was, I was tears of blood when he did that because I'm like, these guys will short every other stock on the stock exchange uh, in good times, um, but yet they wanted protection from shorting when the GFC was on, and yet, you know, they're happy to bring other companies to their knees. So, you know, yet again, you know, and we've got the term funding facility at the moment. I've got to ask a couple of questions of the RBA and estimates, but I'm not sure what the terms of that funding facility was, but it was about a $300 billion funding facility from the RBA to the private banks. I, at the time, the interest rate was 0 0.1, as, as you'd well know. I'm curious to know now if those uh, interest rates are still the same so that that $300 billion, which I don't think gets repaid until next year, um, another two years to go, is it? 200 million. Oh, 200 million, is it? Billion, sorry. Yeah, thanks, Fraser. Um, is whether or not they can park that on the over overnight rate at 2.3%, is it now? 2.2, what, 2.35, I think it is. Um, so they're getting an arbitrage of about 2% on 200 billion, which works out at 4 billion a year. If that's the case, I'm not sure what the terms of the initial, whether or not that was linked to the cash rate or um, what, but I certainly hope that they're not scalping there as well. But uh, yeah, we've got a long way to go. There's only three of us in the room. And I should just note the guy there that sat there before was Ross Cadell. He's a new National Party Senator. He had just had to go back and do uh, Senate, uh, sit in the Senate chamber. But uh, it was good to see him here. So um, hopefully we've got someone from the Nats now who will champion uh, a, a, um, a People's Bank as well. So thanks very much for your time today. Well, as post office people, we are delighted to hear you all support the idea of a postal bank. Like, the government doesn't seem to be too opposed to it. So we would like all you guys to work out how it works. We have the network, we're ready for the work, 
bring it on. Um, has anybody got any questions that you would like to ask anyone in the room? Please help yourself to all the information over there. The unions have apologised. They are deep in conversations with Australia Post this week, so we're unable to attend. But the unions fully support the idea of a postal bank for Australia Post. Their position is it's a foregone conclusion. It's just a matter of time. So hopefully with this movement from Parliament, which is where we have to get this done, we will see a people's bank in the not too distant future. How about we get a time frame from you guys? Well, Tell well, I think Matt said the key thing. It, it's a people's bank and the, the, the power comes from the people. We need that, to rally our that. crowds. You know, the COVID mismanagement uh, has been absolutely horrendous. It's been inhuman for two and a half, going on three years. Um, the solution to that is going to come partly from Parliament, but mostly from the people and from the courts. It's going to require a three-pronged attack. And the, getting a, a, a People's Bank up in Australia is going to be similar. It's going to be a little bit Parliament, most of it from the people. So we've got to get that, that in, in place. That's and, and we have post offices around the country talking to millions of people each week. It will be a hot topic in every community. So. Speak to your community, speak to your local council and talk to whoever you can. Apply pressure wherever you can. Let's get this done for Australia so we own our country again. Thank you all for attending. The important thing I think is everyone in this room, do it for yourself and your family, not <coughs> just the country. Because it is going to be enormously beneficial for every single person other than the bank executives in this country. Yes. And I would second thanking can our. Can I just add one thing? I, I, I really would like to add this. Um, the uh, the uh, BBC did a series on the Renaissance, you know, and uh, it was fairly from the world until the Renaissance came along and uh, science and technology started right there. And the Renaissance, they said, was the Medicis. Who are the Medicis? They were the bankers of Europe. But they were very, very enlightened people um, in art and science. But the foundation of engineering was Brunelleschi, who was on their payroll and lived in their palace, actually. Um, the founder of science was Galileo, who was on their payroll yeah. and lived in their palaces. And, uh, and um, the uh, Botticelli, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, you know, the greatest artists in human history, were all on their payroll. But it was banking. It was banking. And if you get enlightened people, and the mob may not always be enlightened, but as one bloke said to me, in the end, the mob gets it right. And that's a pretty good call. So we're the mob. <laughs> Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you for the Citizens Party for their support in hey. organising this and, and for your ongoing research and support oh, for this campaign. You will really get time this time done. We're waiting for you. Thank you very much. <coughs>